Good morning. I think I'm awake now. I'm awake now. It is good to see you in the house of the Lord on this beautiful Lord's Day. What a glorious September Sunday in Boone, North Carolina. We're glad that you're here. We're glad that you've made the decision and the discernment to be a part of the worship experience at First Baptist Church of Boone on this last Sunday in September. It's good to see each one of you. There are still folks that are gathering for worship and participating in worship via live stream on Facebook and YouTube, and we're extra glad that you're with us this morning as well. God bless you. We've had quite a September in the life of our church. A music and message on September 5th by our former staff members, Curtis and Sarah Privet. On September 12th, we had a celebration of 150 years of a heritage and vision of sharing God's love, and it included a message from Gerald Hodges, music from the Chancel Choir, and greetings and prayers from many of our mission partners uh, and friends. Then on September 19th, we were encouraged by a message from Richard Brunson, one of our mission partners through the North Carolina Baptist on Mission. He's the executive director. And so it was a special September. And today, we gather for worship and we resume a sermon series on the book of James. Uh, and we will conclude that in the next week or so as God leads us. Uh, also, next Sunday, if you'll encourage yourself and write it down and just make a mental note, at the end of our service on October 3rd is our quarterly church conference, a rescheduled church conference. It'll be at the end of the worship experience next Sunday. Please plan to attend. If you received a bulletin, I hope that you'll note the order of worship. The hymns and the responsive reading are numbered and they're found in your hymnal. And that'll assist you and help you as we worship together. A reminder, the offering plates are at the entrances and the exits as you come and go from the sanctuary. Another reminder, child care is offered for bed babies through first grade on this level, just outside this piano door. I encourage you to take advantage of that if you wish uh, and use that anytime during the service. Uh, we love having uh, the littlest ones in worship as well, but that child care is offered for you, for you when needed. We are celebrating the birth of a precious little one out in Austin, Texas. The rose on the pulpit is in thanksgiving to God for the birth of Sloan Willow Schramm. Got some proud grandparents around here and Ken and Pam Schramm. And that beautiful little girl came early and God's covering her and holding her and things are going well. And so we are excited about that. And so this rose reminds us of the gift of life. So we're here. Welcome to worship. Come, let us worship.
us pray together. O oh God, our Creator, we seek your presence as we gather for worship, worship of you alone. You bear the pain of your people. And grant us the gift of wisdom, maturity, and following Jesus, that we may discern your way and live justly and graciously amid the struggles of our own world, this world, and lead us to tell the love of of you for all people. We pray that this worship experience is in your keeping, and pleases and honors you, and glorifies you, O oh God. Amen. Our responsive reading, our call to worship this morning is found in your hymnal. As I mentioned, they were numbered, and the responsive reading is number 530, so you will find it in the section of hymns in the front part of your worship serve, uh, your hymnal for our worship time together, calling ourselves to worship. 530, call of worship, the witness of the people of God. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by his faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So then, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Amen.
Celebrating an anniversary is the celebration of people, the church is people, but it's also a celebration of this place, this holy ground and this sanctuary. And so thankful for all of those that have gone before us that, that felt led by God to build this place that would, would house and be a place of worship that could be filled with a voice like that and the instruments that we enjoy and lead us in worship. What a beautiful place. What a beautiful sanctuary. I'm thankful this morning it was filled with the sounds of journey, the sounds of travel. As we pray for one another, as we pray together, truly prayers of the people with each other and for each other, I encourage you in just a moment, the first few moments, to, to, to lift your voices, to say aloud if led, a name that is on your heart as you pray, lifting that name to God, acknowledging God's presence and God's presence and God's hearing, God's listening, and God's attention uh, to you as you are invited into relationship through prayer. So let's bow and humbly pray to God, lifting names of need to God, and I will close our prayer. pray individually for one another and these that have been spoken. Meet us where we are. O oh, great physician, heal broken bodies emotionally and spiritually and mentally and physically. And God, we lift them to you in prayer in the best way we know how. Taking them to the place of healing. Taking them to the place of hope. New life and new beginning. So God, we bring our broken to you. We grieve with those that are grieving and seek your name and your voice and your face 
and you, God, in providence, claiming these folks and bringing them home. We pray with the grieving and ask that you grant them comfort and strength and peace for the living of this day. Encourage them to get up every day and live, journey, walk. Know they're not alone and in your presence. And, oh, God, we thank you for the gift of life this morning, for the new birth in Texas, the beautiful new little girl, and how proud the Shrams are. So we celebrate life. We celebrate promise. We celebrate eternal life. We celebrate healing in the midst of sickness. Thank you for hearing our prayers, O oh God. We ask you to be with missionaries all over the world, right here locally and out our front door and across the globe, that share the good news of grace and unconditional love and mercy through your gift, the gift of Jesus. So, O oh Lord, in your mercy, we beg you to hear our prayers. Our church is coming off of an event that was labeled an anniversary of 150 years. So this day, remind us of our heritage, remind us of a vision, and lead us not to stay where we are and to move forward together as a community of faith. Oh God, sometimes scriptures are disturbing to us. Sometimes we like to take issue with hard scripture and pretend we know more about our own lives than you, God, or than James' writing could have ever understood. We are not naturally inclined to submit to anyone. But God, on this holy day, help us to realize that submitting to you is not giving up, but gaining blessing, gaining peace, gaining hope, the opportunity and the Ability to finish our journey as we walk toward reunion, as we walk toward eternal life with you. We do want to be near you, O oh God. Alert us to the devil's temptations. And draw us nearer and nearer to your heart. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. This day, our epistle lesson, as I shared with you, is found in the book of James, a New Testament letter to the early church. The pastor of the early church, James, sharing wisdom and direction and guidance and word for his people, people of all different faiths, of all different backgrounds and different journeys and travels that brought them to the place of community. And he's encouraging them to discover wisdom and understanding. We've been sharing a lot of his tough words to us the weeks that led us to September. So our text this morning is the third chapter of James, beginning with verse 13. James 3, verse 13, and I'll read through verse 8 in chapter 4. James 3, hear the word of God. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy, selfish ambition in your heart, do not be boastful and false to the truth. For such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, it's unspiritual, it's devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Conflicts, disputes, among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. You covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in dispute and conflict. You do not ask. You do not have because you do not ask. 
You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Adulterers, do not you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is for nothing that the scripture says, God yearns jealously for the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives all the more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. The word of God for the people of God. What a lesson. Man. James, the preacher of the early church, does not mince words. We share together James's desire for that early church to finish what they have started for many finish and few start. And so he mustered up sermons of be patient, leaning not on your own understanding, but on each other and on God's word. And so he taught us to, to be still and know that God is God. And then, Paul, then James taught that early church to listen, to listen, to control that tongue. Oh, it may be small, but the lack of control of the tongue brings much havoc, much destruction, much division, conflict, and dispute. And this morning, the text reminds us of the need to be content. What you have and the concern for James' desire for the church and the desire for them to know grace and peace and Jesus. What a great example I think James uses that I just read. God's desire for you. God's flat out love for you. God's jealousy of spirit of wanting you to know God. Know the spirit and the desire of God for that spirit to dwell in you. Do you ever think of God that way? That God wants it so bad for you. He wants the spirit to dwell in you. So has led James in his teachings and with the early, almost first church to be patient, to finish, to listen, control the tongue, to be about works for your faith on this earth without works makes no difference. And I've been saying it this way. Do you want to take anybody with you? Maggie, it was beautiful. I, I, I just love that song and I I know I almost messed you up singing it to you right before worship, and you, you still hung in there. But it's a beautiful song of journey. But we could just kind of sit back and get in the you know comfortable chair or push these pews are cushioned, so we can we can get where we're comfortable for a while, and we can just sit and say it's not about anybody else, Roy. I'm just gonna hum and I'm gonna sing, and I'm on my way to heaven. See my mother. I'm on my way to see my father. I'm on my way. And any kind of thought that I'm supposed to go beyond that chair in this pew to take somebody with me, I don't have time for that, God. I don't have energy for that, God. Are you sure that's what you're asking of me, God? James is saying, absolutely. Absolutely. Faith without works is dead. Yeah, you you're you're on your way. But do you want to take anybody with you? Are you interested in taking anybody with you? That's the story of this early church. Do you care as, as much as God cares? I'm not asking you to be God, but, but is there that, man, I want that spirit of God to dwell in each of you. And I'm desperate. I want it so badly. So James says, church, want it that badly. Want it. So make a commitment early and up front to finish. For many start and few finish. Make a commitment early 
that it's not just about what you know and what you got to say. Listen to someone else and control that tongue. For the goal is taking someone with you. The goal is they can hear you share of unconditional love and grace and mercy, peace and unconditional love. James 4.1 said it this way. Conflicts and disputes absolutely plague us. And James contends they come from the cravings that are within us. They come, verse 1 says, from the war within us. Teresa beautifully prayed an offertory prayer about giving heavenly-minded or earthly-minded. What are we craving? Why are we giving? Why are we giving? God loves a cheerful and joyful giver. Gives with a craving that the Spirit will dwell within all you come in contact with, that you speak to, that you set desire to take with you, to take with you in your life and the way that you live. James said over and over, you claim to be religious. I'm not sure that's the first century word, but you claim to be church. We're gathered as a community of faith here. So you claim a religious tone that you're religious. Yes, I am, we might say. We talked a lot about all the things that conflict that for the world when the world watches. All talk, no listening. Causes and clouds truth. And no one's able to hear what we want to say. James wants us to be proclaimers of hope when the world sees us finish the race. To finish what we have started. To be complete and become mature followers in the world. So the text today is being content and away from envy and selfish ambition. I've been enjoying it. Matt, I, I can't hit a golf ball like Matt. I can't drive one that far, but I've really been watching. I've really loved watching uh, the Ryder Cup and some of the golf tournaments of late where there's this guy that, can, that drives the ball really good because he's a pro, but he's about 80 yards behind. This guy that can just mash it as far as you can, the eye can see. But yet he finishes and ends up winning most of the time. May we be content with who we are, what we have, and what God blesses us with. Not so friend of the world that we want to be like that or be that gift or sing like that or teach like this. May we be in the midst of the church, gifted with the gifts that God has given us. And so James teaches with a desire for his people to have Christian maturity and wisdom. We don't need to look in a mirror and see what we need to change and walk away and not change, James says. Monitoring our own words and our actions. So today, let's talk about envy and selfish ambition in the midst of this desire to be church, to the desire to, to know some maturity and some wisdom and understanding for our text began with people, may you know wisdom and understanding. Envy and selfish ambition take us away from our calling and our place in this world. Envy and self-ambition take us away from our calling for we begin to say, I would rather, and I know better, God, I'd rather be that. Envy and self-ambition block us from being one of faith and liberty and mercy. Teachers and parents, what happens when we're motivated by envy and selfish ambition? It becomes a strategy we use to keep from hearing and doing, right? Envy leads us to shortcuts. It allows us to be all show and a desire of the applause of the world. And it results in we've got this gut feeling we're never good enough. We are measuring what the world is saying, got it, to what God is blessing and giving you. There's no moments with a mirror, which James is begging the church to spend time looking in the mirror. There's no moments with a mirror, only with a window. We're busy keeping our eyes. 
James says, his church on the world. It leads to leading our sons and daughters, this selfish ambition and envy. It leads to leading our sons and daughters and students to be what we fail to be. How often have you said, oh, they're living their life through their children? Not do it, not, didn't get to do what they thought they could have done, so they're going to live it through their children. And all we lead them to be is what we fail to be. We ask them to live our lives for us instead of their own. Instead of their own. Kyle Matthews wrote a song about Albert Schweitzer called Make My Life My Argument. Make My Life My Argument. The song came out of a story by Fred Craddock, the great preacher at Emory, and he was going to an organ concert of Schweitzer's. To argue with him, the book, The Quest for the Historical Jesus. And so Craddock felt the book a little shallow, and it didn't, la it didn't have a whole lot of wisdom in it. And so following the concert for a question and answer time, Fred Craddock was ready for battle. He was ready to charge. And so Schweitzer entered the room and said, I want to thank all of you for coming. You have been very warm and hospitable, listened but I've got to get back to my people in Africa now. They're poor and they're sick, they're hungry and they're dying, and I have to go. We have a medical station there, and if there's anybody in here that has been prompted by the love of Jesus to go with me and help, come on. You're welcome to go. Craddock said that was the day he learned to stop wringing his hands and realizing all the wisdom he had and that he wanted to share with somebody else and change them. And it became the day that gave him hope. He heard Schweitzer say, I want to make my life my argument. I want to make the works and the way I live driven by faith in God to be my argument. James reminds us this morning that what's in the way of understanding, what's in the way of wisdom, is envy and selfish ambition. I like James, the preacher, telling us what to say yes to, not just what to say no to. Not a whole lot about the list of don'ts. But be this, church. James says, instead of envy and selfish ambition, in our text, choose contentment and peace. Choose it. Choose contentment and peace instead. For in verse 13, chapter 3, verse 1, I read where envy comes from. It's earthly. It's unspiritual. It's devilish. It's from inside. It's real. It's human. But it's nothing new nothing new it's a rationalization of behavior everybody's doing it right I can ask for forgiveness instead of permission right you can't find that in the book by the way or I can just want what others have instead of what God wants for me it's not anything new and it wasn't new to that early church for in our scriptures, Cain killed Abel out of envy. Joseph was shipped off by his brothers, envy. King David killed Uriah, covering his own self, but envy. The Gospel of Matthew says over and over, the enemies of Jesus turned Jesus into the authorities because of envy. Not wanting to lose their place and position. So we're all prone to this selfish ambition and envy. We want a house like that. We want money like that. We want to retire like that. But it's not just material, it's personal for James. He wants us to desire a life of journey and a life of assurance and contentment and peace and a desire to take people with us. On this journey. We are all prone that way. We want life less complicated and less pressure. 
Married want to be single. Single want to be married. Young want to be old. You noticed I didn't run up the steps anymore after the first try. Old want to be young. Retired want to be working. Working want to be retired. Powerful want simple. Simple want power. Envy when something good happens. We're bitter rather than celebrating others' victory. Envy. We're resentful when good happens to somebody else. Frederick Beekner says envy is the consuming desire for others. The consuming desire for others to be as unsuccessful as we are. A desire for everybody. You don't go to a church meeting or a church convention and loads of churches and mission groups and all of those things gather and the word is said... Well, praise the Lord, no one else is growing either. Really? Really? We're satisfied with that? We're content with that? Envy. The economic system of our world today thrives on it. It entices you to want what you don't have. You're not happy if you don't look, eat, drink, or drive. Whatever it is. So response to envy for James is that peace comes from wisdom. Those who make peace are what the church was designed for and birthed for and is the bride of Christ. The conflict and quarreling comes from wanting what you do not have. It's the absence of peace. James says you do not receive because you don't ask. And you don't ask in the desire to please God. James, peace means shalom. So he's saying heavenly wisdom comes comes when we establish peaceful homes. We treat everybody as equal when we provide for the basic needs of each other. The invitation this morning to walk out this door and to go into an absolutely beautiful day is to not let envy block your vision because then eventually you're not going to ever be able to see what you have. As your pastor, I know some of you have enormous pain. You have enormous pain. Hurt, lonely, lots of misunderstanding, lots of questions. Lots of why, or lots of how did we get there? Or how did we get here? We don't have peace that passes understanding. And we cry out for what we don't have, right? God doesn't blame you, judge you for having envious feelings. Knows of our humanness. That's why that desire is so great. And James makes it clear that Jesus, that God is going, I want that spirit to dwell in each of them. That's why I sent Jesus to this earth. It doesn't blame you for being human, for insides that look around and have selfish ambition or jealousy. But envy and selfish ambition because of God and because of the sacrifice of Jesus does not have to be the driving force in your life anymore. It just says be careful with what you do with it. So when you feel right now that you don't have what you want or you're not what you want to be, take And I've shared this before. Take that feeling. You're there. I'm not where I want to be. I'm not feeling what I want to feel. I don't have what I want to have. I just feel nothing. Take that feeling as if you have a fever. As if you are burning up. You're sick with a fever. And you don't want that fever. So then you look up all the different diagnoses and all the reasons you might have a fever and how to feed a fever and let God this morning in that feeling let God hold you and blanket you till the fever breaks let God hold you till the fever breaks acknowledge the reality of that in your life James individuals and as a church our realities But don't let that stay and be the driving force in your life. 
Let God hold you and blanket you till that fever breaks. And in the midst of that being blanketed, pray for the stuff, the one, the other, that you're just spending all your energy wishing you were and had. God's blanket and breaking of your fever can take that away. You are God's idea. You ever think that? You're God's idea. God created us. You're gifted. You have people. You were loved when you were unlovable. Pray and pray and pray and let God blanket you and blanket you and blanket you till you can see that all over again. You may not have ever seen that. God loves you. But most of you have. So this morning I beg that you pray and let God hold you until you see it again. And it drives you to take somebody with you. Instead of I've checked the box, I got it going on. I'm good. Pray till you can see it all over again. We would normally have an invitation hymn, a hymn of response, and stand and sing together. And how is God leading us to respond? And we're not going to do that this morning. But know where I am. Know where this church family is, this, this beautiful place. There are folks that would share about this discipling, about this growing, about this letting Jesus into your heart, about this becoming church, about being a part of a community of faith, and we want all that for you. It's a desperate desire. I'd love to have that conversation with you. If you want to make this your church home, you grab me and we'll get it done. We'll, need, we'll lean on you and let you role model to us as we seek to disciple and help you. May God be glorified. Let's stand and have the benediction together. Our benediction this morning is in the book of James, verse 7 and 8. Hear these words as you go. People, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the world and, he, and the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and God will draw 